We are told that almost 25 million jobs could be lost worldwide as a result of COVID-19, according to the ILO. And um, they say that an initial assessment of the impact of COVID-19 on the global work of work says that the effect will be far reaching, pushing millions of people into unemployment, underemployment and working poverty and processes, measures for a decisive, coordinated and immediate response. So today, the topic is very close home. COVID-19 is bringing many challenges across boards and in management during this season. Uh, today, we have a very special guest speaker, Catherine Musakali, who will be uh, introduced by Maureen Indegwa. And to start, at, to start us off, we wish to look at um, the program so at 3.05, we'll have Moritin Degwa, the ED and CEO, will introduce the keynote speaker. And between 3.15 and 4.30, she has the whole playing ground to give us and deliver some uh, conversation around the focus areas for boards and management during, post, uh, during and post COVID-19. Thereafter, we will announce the next webinar and then we shall have closing remarks. So without further ado, I wish to welcome Moritin Degwa, uh, to welcome all of us. Thank you very much. I am Phyllis uh, Maitha, the head of membership here. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me warmly welcome all of you again to this webinar. We really thank you so, so much for having logged in on time. Today, we have a very good speaker, um, uh, none other than Catherine Musakali. But before we invite her, allow me just to mention a few areas because our topic is quite pertinent to all of us who are today working or who are even in self-employment. We are all aware about COVID-19 issues, and uh, this has spread all over the world, with some countries slowly returning to business while others continuing being heavily impacted. And the impact of the pandemic on the global economy is phenomenal. Just like uh, Phyllis indicated, we understand that uh, there are lots of jobs, obviously, which have been lost. In fact, uh, that, that's a reality. Uh, we've been seeing communication about uh, uh, closure of hotels, closures of businesses, and so on and so forth not to mention also institutions of learning like ours, how they've been affected. However, at this pivotal, uh, uh, pivotal moment, there are, no, there are clear choices which have to be made. And the way in which boards go about, the, go about uh, their work at this point in time, we understand is obviously going to be crucial in a firm's ability to emerge from the current crisis and forge ahead into a new era of economic recovery and sustainability for the benefit of its stakeholders. Now, even though we have been on, in COVID-19 crisis mode for some time now, in many respects, there could be long-term consequences of the pandemic. For instance, other uncertainties exist, such as the degree to which organizations will, will remain sustainable to weather the crisis, and that means their sustain, sustainability. There is also the uncertainty regarding the extent to which the workforce will be affected or has been affected in the long term. Some companies, as you understand, are currently doing everything possible to stabilize the situation, knowing very well that the actions taken now are critical and will define the recovery efforts once the crisis fades. In our considered view, we believe that a typical crisis normally plays out in three time frames. One is a response, which is basically how to react to the crisis. The second response is um, recovery. In other words, how to position for the rebound, and finally, thriving, or how to ensure success post the crisis, in this case, COVID-19. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we warmly welcome you to today's gathering, which is going to be listening on focus areas for boards and management during post-COVID-19 by none other than Catherine Musakali. Catherine Musakali, advocate of the High Court. Um, Catherine Musakali is an advocate of the High Court and a fellow of the Institute of Certified Secretaries of Kenya. She's a founder of Dorian Associates LLP, a firm specializing in governance matters and commercial legal consultancies. Prior to founding Dorian Associates, Catherine worked for Shell Kenya Limited, now Vivo Energy Kenya Limited, as their company secretary and head of legal for over 15 years. During which time she, du during which period she managed the legal function of, functions of Shell operating in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Morocco, Egypt, and Tunisia. She has worked for Shell in the UK during which period she specialized in mergers and acquisitions and other commercial transactions, as well as being the legal focal point for all contracting and procurement matters for its business in Africa. 
Catherine is, is the founder and chairperson of the Women on Boards Network. And this, and she's currently the company secretary for a number of companies. She holds a Bachelor of Law degree and a Master of Law degree from the University of Nairobi, a higher national diploma in law, Kenya, as well as a certificate in securities and investment from the Securities and Investment Institute of London. Ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome Catherine Musakali. And the easy way to do is just simply do the ululation. Catherine, karibu sana, and welcome to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Murithi. Um, always a pleasure to interact with uh, members of uh, Kim to speak about a topic I'm very uh, passionate about. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to speak about the focus areas for boards and management during and post COVID-19. Uh, indeed, as uh, Muredi has said, these are unprecedented times. Um, there is nowhere where you will find that textbook that tells you as a board member or a member of management what you should be doing so that you can make sure that the organization is best placed to survive and to be sustainable in the future. And so I'm going to focus on some of the areas that I think would really, really help you as board members and management teams to position the company for the future, to position institutions for the future. If you're an institution of higher learning, what should your board be concentrating on? What should your management team be concentrating on to make sure that you're really thriving and surviving in the future? Now, one of the things that has stuck in my mind was a quotation by, that was shared uh, by a friend of mine who said to me, Catherine, in Africa, if you're a CEO of an organization and you're just focused on survival, chances are that by 2022, your company will no longer be in existence. I think that for me really scared me, first and foremost, because I didn't understand what he was saying until he said the next sentence, which was, if you're focused on sustainability, on innovation, on growth, chances are that by 2022, you will either be double the size you are today or you will be at least 100% of the size you are today. Now, what that meant is this, that as leaders, we should not just focus on the crisis. We should not focus on what is happening now, but keep focused on the future keep focused on the innovations that we need to be put uh, to, to put in place keep focused on how do i grow this business to be bigger than what it is today how do i make sure that this institution is surviving and thriving in the future and so that is what i'm going to focus on but before i do I just want to share a quick video which will tell us what we are going through today is nothing unusual. That as long as we are in business, as long as we are an institution, disruption will always happen. So let's see a video for the time being and then we shall start the conversation. In business, there will always be disruption. Your success depends on how you manage it. And no business is immune. Kodak, founded in 1888. For a century, it dominates film and camera sales. At its peak in 1976, Kodak claims 90% of film sales and 85% of camera sales in the US. Just 12 months earlier, it invents the digital camera, the event that would mark the demise of this hugely successful business. For fear of cannibalizing film sales, Kodak is reluctant to pursue filmless photography. 1988, Fuji market the first consumer all digital camera. 2000, the first camera phone is sold. 2004, photo sharing site Flickr is launched. 
2006, camera phones outsell cameras. 2012, Kodak files for bankruptcy. Ansett Airlines, founded 1935. From 1957 to 1989, Ansett and TAA enjoy a duopoly for domestic flights in Australia, protected by the two airline policy introduced by the Menzies government. 1990, domestic aviation in Australia is deregulated. International carriers are permitted to fly domestic routes. New domestic carriers emerge. And in 2001, ANSET is placed into voluntary administration. Huh? Lego, founded in 1932, making wooden toys for children. 1949, Lego starts producing the plastic interlocking bricks that will make them a household brand. From the 1950s to the 1970s, Lego is on its way to becoming the most popular toy in history. New technology sees a change in consumer demand. Television, electronic toys, video games, the internet. 2003 and 2004, Lego posts losses of 435 million US dollars. On the brink of bankruptcy, Lego reacts, launching a back to basics rescue plan. Product lines are reduced by 30%. Non-profitable theme parks and investments are sold. And the business gets back to focusing on its core products and values. By 2013, the turnaround is complete. Lego achieves record revenue and profit. 2014, a hugely successful Lego movie is released. 2015, Lego is named the most powerful brand in the world in the brand finance report. In business, there will always be disruption. Your success depends on how you manage it. Awesome. What are some of your takeaways from that video? Anyone? Sorry. Anyone? What are some of your takeaways from that uh, short video? Anybody? Just unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Hello, my name is Jacqueline. Please go ahead. From, mm -hmm. from this video, I think for me, my takeaway is we should be good readers of signs of times and aggressively act and not react. Yeah. Fantastic. Being forward looking. Don't react, but act. Wonderful. Anyone else? Just unmute yourself and share. Did that video speak to you? Hello. I think um, what I. Uh, um, my takeaway is basically imagine things uh, that that we are we are we should be welcome to literally abandon a plan that is not working in order to survive. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in order to survive, if something is not working, abandon it. Look for innovative ways of achieving your vision. There was someone else wanting to share. Oh, I love the chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the doctor is really good. My takeaway is that uh, the market forces are so strong. When they decide to go one direction, the providers have to think that way or just get out of business. So the market or the consumer, the customer dictates what they want. Exactly. The market di dictates what they want. One last one before we move on. I can give you something. My name is James. Yes, please, James. Uh, so if you stand still and are complacent with the current situation, others will come and overtake you. So you, you need to be flexible. You always need to be mobile and uh, factor yourself with the uh, every changes so that you can survive in the business place. Great. Don't be static. Okay. So let's talk about Kenya. How has the pandemic impacted 
institutions, organizations, and how can boards and management teams navigate it? And so that is what I'm going to focus on. And before I get there, there were some statistics that uh, Phyllis shared at the beginning. And I just want to highlight some of those statistics. So this was a survey that was carried out of the CEOs of the Fortune two, uh, five, 500 list. And they were asked a number of questions which are relevant for our discussion today. And the first question they were asked was, when will economic activity return to the level it was in before the pandemic? Now, you will see that the biggest number, which is 52.4%, said that will happen in 2022. Now, I shudder to think what that means for Kenya, because we are already in election mode. So if we are not concentrating on the economy, on just getting the economy back on its feet, and we are more focused on the elections, that could very easily move to 2023, 2024. They were also asked the question, when will at least 90% of your workforce have returned to their usual workplace? 26.2% of the CEOs said never, which means the face of the workplace has changed. What that means is that the decisions that we make as board members, the decisions that we make as management teams going forward, must keep that in mind. Then they were asked, have you laid off or followed workers in response to the crisis, I was very happy to note that 48.9% of the CEOs said, no, we haven't. We have kept our staff. We are trying to make sure that we don't lay off anybody. And then they were asked, in January 2021, how do you expect your company's total employment to compare to what it was in January 2020. And 53.6% of them said slightly less. In other words, they recognized that there were going to be some layoffs and the way we structure our business strategy going forward needs to take that into consideration. They were then asked, at your company, how will the crisis affect the face of technological transformation? And 75% of them said they will accelerate, it will accelerate technological transformation. What that means is that as board members, as management teams, we cannot afford to be left behind. We need to find the place of technological transformation for our businesses. And then one last one, which I found interesting, was when do you expect capital spending at your company to exceed the 2019 levels? And 35.7% of them said 2021. So you can see the types of outlook or the type of outlook which CEOs are seeing. How does that impact us as board members? How does that impact us as management teams? As we sit down to think about innovation, to think about the face of the business, how the business and how institutions will look in the future. How do these trends affect us? And so the first area of focus for boards and management teams is really the strategy of the institution, the future of the institution. And in that regard, what I would like to suggest for management teams and boards is that there is need to validate your strategy. 
that the strategy you had put in place before the pandemic hit is not necessarily relevant for you today. So you need to sit back as boards and as management teams and ask, is this strategy still the right strategy? If you're in the education sector and your strategy is built around brick and mortar and children going to school and adults going to school, maybe let's, let's talk about tertiary education because perhaps the lower levels will recover somehow. But the tertiary education, the universities and so on and so forth, how does a strategy build on brick and mortar sit with you. So you need to sit back and validate that strategy and say, how can we innovate so that we are still delivering the services, still achieving the mission and the vision that we have, but using other means. You need to spend time reimagining the future, focusing on innovation and asking the question, are we going to survive and thrive in the future? And the beauty is that many of us in institutions are sitting on a lot of data. So how are we using data analytics to influence decision making? If you are in the hotel industry, how are you using the numbers to influence your decision making? And boards are advised, management teams are advised that when you sit around at a table thinking about your strategy, you may not necessarily come up with all the answers that you need. And so my advice is at some corner in your institution, set aside a room that you call ideation room or war room and just tell people, Anytime a wild idea comes to your mind, please go on, go into that room and put it on that flip chart. We will come in once a week. We will harness those ideas, collect those ideas, harness what is coming through and feed that into the development of our strategy. I want to encourage boards and management teams to ensure that they are balancing the short-term needs of the institutions and the long-term needs of the institutions. Do not focus so much on the short-term that you sacrifice the long-term. I remember when I was working for Shell, Shell at one point decided to exit from Western Kenya and sold the, the, all the uh, fuel uh, sites in the Western Kenya region. It did not take five years. Shell was wanting to go back to Western Kenya. And guess what? They had to pay like five times more the cost of the sites that they already had to get back. So it was a short term a business strategy that delivered results in the short term, but it hurt the institution in the future. So please ensure that you are balancing the short term with the long term. But at the same time, remember the quotation I had at the beginning. If you focus too much on the challenges of the crisis and every time I meet you, you are just talking about, oh, things are bad, I don't know what, you potentially will miss out on other disruptors and other opportunities because your mind is so fo focused on the crisis that you don't see the other opportunities that may come with the crisis. The second key area of focus for management teams and board members is digital transformation. Remember what I showed you on this slide? That 75% of CEOs said the crisis was going to accelerate digital transformation. And so it is an area that 
everybody, every board member, every management team member must ask, what do we need to, to do to transform the business, to adopt digital uh, ways of doing things? So do use digitization as an opportunity for innovation and make the most of the digitization wave. Drive business strategies. Grab new opportunities that come your way. Find new ways of working. Reach out to new customers, new business models. If you think about Kim, for example, I am sure that Kim's strategy, KIM's strategy, was very focused on having membership within Kenya. With the use of webinars and other ways, what stops KIM from having membership all the way in China, in the US? Because you're able to reach new markets using digitization. What stops somebody in Kenya from working for a company in the US? New opportunities, new customers, and you're working for the company in the US without going to the US because of digitization. But even as we adopt digital ways of doing things, we must be aware that these ways come with new risks and new challenges. And therefore, don't just digitize blindly, but make sure that you are also managing the risks that come with those. For the board, therefore, is to make sure that management is putting in place an appropriate digitization strategy and the board is responsible for overseeing the digital transformation of the business and making sure that management are covering any challenges, any risks that come with that digitization. So that's the second area of focus for boards and management. The third area of focus for boards and management, and I will give you an opportunity to just uh, interact with me on some of these areas, is that this is the time that both the board and management need to sit back and to ask themselves whether they have the right skills to navigate the crisis. If you look at the board, are you properly constituted to navigate the crisis? Do you have the right skills on your board to think innovatively, to think about new customers, to shepherd the organization into the future? Are those skills that you have on your board aligned to the new strategy that you have or to the validated strategy that you have? What skills are critical for you as an organization that they must be present on the board? And do you have them? And if you don't have them, how can you access them? It doesn't mean that every skill you need must be represented on the board. There are very many ways of accessing those skills without necessarily bringing people with those skills on the board. But there are ways of working with people with those skills. When you look at management, what about the capacity, the capability of management to shepherd the organization? Does management have the appropriate resolve and resilience to take this institution into the future. And if they don't have the right skills, what should we be doing? We can't just sit back and say, we'll take people home. No, you can retool people, you can reskill people so that they are able to work better. If you have a receptionist who is not able to work because you're not going to the office, is there something else that that receptionist can do in the organization? Can you reassign them duties? Can you 
redefine their role in the organization? Do you have digitization skills? Do you have business development skills? Do you have innovation skills within your management? So as a management team, are we properly constituted in terms of the skills we need to take the organization into the future? The fourth area is really about emotional intelligence. This area has never been so important than now. And I was happy to hear Muravi talk about emotional intelligence as an offering that KIM has. Because we have learned over time that emotionally intelligent boards and emotionally intelligent management skills communicate better with their stakeholders. Because they are aware of the stakeholder needs. They are aware whether their messaging is going to be palatable to the stakeholders or not. They can connect with their stakeholders better. And so even as we speak about skills at the board and at management level, we must also be speaking about emotional intelligence for those two teams. And the beauty about emotional intelligence is you can learn it anytime. You start from now and you keep developing your emotional intelligence skills. And history has shown and uh, data has shown that emotionally, intelligence pe emotionally intelligent people perform at least 60% better than those who are not. So focus on emotional intelligence. The other area of focus for boards and management is really HR matters. Employee welfare. HR matters are so, so critical to boards and management because the greatest asset that any institution has, the greatest asset that any organization has is the people. And so it is important that we focus on employee welfare. It is important that we aim to keep the talent we have. Let me give you an example of the airline industry, which is really, really struggling. Now, it takes years to develop a pilot. How are you going to recover that talent if you let it go? Are there ways of perhaps maintaining that talent without letting them go? So those people in your organization who make things move, who you rely on for the future of your organization, the focus should be, how can I keep these people? Focus also on the culture of the organization. Focus on ensuring that you're communicating more and more with your people, making sure that you're harnessing the ideas they have. Make them have a sense of ownership of the institution. And believe you me, they will be the ones focusing on making sure that the institution survives in the future. But don't be blind. Ensure you have succession planning going. That is very, very critical. Just remember that people are so, so important in any institution. Now, as both the management team and boards work together to ensure that they are shepherding the organization into the future. It is important that you focus on ensuring that there is a good relationship between the board and management. That the board should be focused on providing oversight so that management can deliver, can implement. Let me use the analogy of a war. 
when people are fighting in a war, I've never fought in a war, but I have read stories about wars. There is usually somebody sitting at the watchtower, watching where the enemies are coming from and giving directions to the troops on the ground. Assume that the board is that person sitting in the watchtower. They are part of the war, but they are not actually fighting. They are just giving oversight and providing the troops on the ground with pertinent information. Information such as, you know, the other team, the other the people we are fighting are no longer fighting just running all over the ground. They are now coming with horses. So what do we do before they arrive? What do we need to do? So ensure that there is focus on the big picture by the board while management focuses on implementation. And the board must shy away from increasing management's burden at this point in time. Because management have a lot to do. They have a lot on their hands. So as a board member, this is the time that I should not be too demanding on management. This is the time that I should be helping them with the burden they have. They don't really need to be driving to my house every day to deliver papers. They need that time to focus on their business. So how, what can I do to lighten their burden as a board member? Another key area of focus for both management teams and um, boards is the whole issue of sustainability. And sustainability from a governance perspective is defined as being ESG, environmental social governance. So focus on sustainability. Don't just focus on delivering a profit in monetary terms because that is short-lived. Focus on the three uh, parameters that deliver sustainability, the environment, social, and governance. All those put together will ultimately deliver the profits that we are looking for. And so the board and management need to define sustainability going forward and then work towards that sustainability. Now, another key area of focus for both the boards and management is risk governance, internal controls, and business continuity. This is the time that both the boards and management need to revisit their risk management frameworks to ask the question, do they respond to the current environment? And people have referred to this environment as being a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain. Um, what is the C? Somebody tell me what the C is. Complex. Complex, uh huh, and ambiguous. Okay. So, is our risk management framework aligned to the VUCA environment? Have we validated it? Have we picked up the new risks that come with it? Have we focused on internal controls to ensure that these internal controls are aligned to the new environment? When you look at your internal controls that you had previously, maybe they did not take into consideration that you'll be sitting in different locations. How do you ensure that they are alive to the current operating environment. So ensure that as a board, as management, risk management becomes part and parcel of your daily work. That anything that you do, risk management is integrated in it. But at the same time, COVID has taught us that we do need to ensure 
that our business continuity plans and crisis plans are working all the time. So validate them. Validate them to make sure that if anything happens in the future, you are actually able to stop and operate within a very short time so that your institutions do not suffer going forward. Now, stakeholder engagement and management is also critical for both the boards and management. And during this time of the pandemic and post the pandemic, you will find that your stakeholders are hungry for information. You will find that the stakeholders want to know how the institution is performing. This is the time to communicate more than you previously did. This is the time to forge very good relationships with your key stakeholders. This is the time to disclose more and more information. This is the time to show empathy with your stakeholders. If you're talking about a company, a profit-making company, for example, if I was a shareholder, my question would be, is there a dividend for me at the end of this financial year? I would need to know sooner rather than later whether that is a possibility. I would want to know sooner rather than later whether management is going to come back to me asking me to put in more capital. If I was an employee, I want to know whether I have a job tomorrow or not. I want to know whether I have a salary cut. So please do focus on stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management because that way you can harness many, many ideas from your stakeholders. There is need to focus on performance, of course, both for managements, uh, management teams as well as board members. Now, I want to speak about something that is gaining ground uh, even here in Kenya now, which is KPIs for boards. We are so used to having KPIs in place for management teams, but we hardly talk about KPIs for board members. What are the KPIs for board members? When you come to assessing their performance, what do you hold them accountable for? Should you think of putting in a performance scorecard for the chairman? Should you think of putting in a performance scorecard for individual board members? And those can be simple things like stakeholder engagement, things like uh, when do you um, meet, if you're a bank, uh, can you make sure that you're meeting the governor of the central bank uh, at least once a year, so on and so forth. So ensuring that there is a performance management system that includes putting in place KPIs, not just for management teams, but also for KPIs, for, for board members. So that when you come to board evaluation, then it is based on factual uh, smart goals that you can really um, uh, gauge going forward. So that, those are, in my view, uh, areas that board members and management teams need to focus on to make sure that the organization is able to thrive into the future, that the organization is able to really grow post COVID-19. And so before I end, I want to play another video for you, which talks about the stages of business disruption. And this gentleman who you will see in the video owns a bakery and he is told that he has gluten intolerance, which means he can't run his bakery. So how does he survive after that? Those are the questions that we answer. And so for you as an institution, what is your gluten intolerance? And how do you turn around so that you still do what you are focused on, you still can achieve your mission and vision without 
getting into having to close down the company going forward. To play the video and then we can have a good discussion. I'm sorry, Mr. Baker, but you've developed a severe gluten intolerance. supposed to see the video to view you're not able to see it i'm sorry no i can't see is everybody able to see the video everybody else able to see the video sorry about that yes can see the video, the video. you were seeing it yes i was see. I didn't see it. Oh dear. So okay. I don't know what okay. the problem was. I cannot that see it. Okay. So just project it again. Or just that last slide for the video. Were you able to see it? Yes. Yes. I was Not from the beginning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but it was small at the corner. Mm. Okay. The let, poor eyesight, like we can't see. Okay. Let me let me try again. All right. Uh I'll share again. Okay. Technological challenges. Let's see whether we can do it. Are you seeing the video? Can you see yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. Now, just play. Okay. So I can play it now. Okay. All yes. right. Let me try and get to where we were.
One gluten-free croissant. Yeah. Wait, does that have butter in it? Yes. You wouldn't happen to have any without butter, uh, like a butter substitute, like olive oil or canola oil, coconut oil, grapeseed oil. I mean, any oils at all. I gotta return this croissant. Return a croissant? There's no nuts. I took a bite. No nuts on the inside. No almonds, no cashews, there's no peanuts in there, there's no walnuts, I expected nuts! I'm allergic to nuts, I'm also allergic to eggs, milk, butter, sugar, uh, no, salt. No, I'm allergic to nuts! I'm not allergic to anything, I just want nuts! Nuts, 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 Every year, thousands of people are diagnosed with a gluten intolerance. Where will they go when they need custom-made croissants? Hi, I'm Joseph from Joseph's Gluten-Free Bakery. When I was diagnosed with a gluten intolerance, I thought my life was over. But after seeing just how many people want custom-made gluten-free croissants, I seized the opportunity to cook up the Croissant Creator app. The Croissant Creator app. With over 3 billion combinations, the Croissant Creator app allows you to build your croissant any way you like it and have it delivered fresh to your door. Or come on down to the store and ask for Joseph. I'll make it for you myself. <laughs> Joseph's Bakery. Let your biggest concerns be my biggest opportunities. When you're hungry for some dough, you gotta go to Joseph. Okay. Right. So let's talk about that uh, video for a moment. What do you think about the key messages coming out of that video? Anyone? And, and focus on boards and management teams. What are the key messages coming out? Anyone? Just speak and mute yourself and speak. I think there's the need to capitalize on market gaps. Look for market gaps and fill them. Rosemary, thank you. Look for market gaps. There is always an opportunity in the market. Look for market gaps and fill them. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I think we've got to be flexible enough to adapt to changes around us so that we cope. Exactly. Flexible enough. If Joseph had gone home and slept and said, oh, no, um, uh, I have a gluten intolerance. I can't run a bakery. Let me just sleep and hope to die. He would surely have died. Okay. But he, an idea certainly hit him when he went to throw away his garbage and he found he could make these gluten free uh, croissants and so on and so forth. There are always opportunities around us. Anybody else? Use uh, the complaints yeah. that customers give to change your business so that you can identify their needs. Completely. Can you imagine you're just sitting there like him and everybody is coming to you with all sorts of different uh, ideas? He could have sat back and said, shut up, guys. But he didn't. 
he listened to them very calmly and he used the ideas to put uh, in place a strategy that is world class. Innovations that have seen his business grow from strength to strength. Any other thoughts? Yes, um, there was the use of technology to come mm -hmm. up with uh, custom made croissants. Great technology, digital transformation. So in your business, where you are on the management team, where you're a board member, what digital solutions are you going to put in place to harness new opportunities, new markets, new customers? Okay, anyone else? Now I am convinced that only the ladies were listening. Oh, great, Kobia. <laughs> You, you differentiate your product according to your competitors. Yes, you must have a differentiated product. If you're doing what everybody is doing, you're competing for a smaller market. But if you have a differentiated product, you have a full market to yourself. Okay? Yeah. Any other gentleman? <laughs> Muraidi, you have to stand up for the boy child. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot has been said, but yes, indeed, there's a, there's a lot of learnings that we can pick. One of the things that uh, clearly we saw is, uh, besides also differentiation, is that mm -hmm. you also need to be focused. You need to know exactly what you want to do and you go for it. Yes, you have to know. And, and I've always said that passion is half the job done. If if there is passion in your business, you have a very clear vision of where you want to go and delivery will be very, very easy. Okay, so allow me to finish with uh, one last uh, slide um, and then we can talk about, um, we can discuss a number of things. Now I have to be very careful about uh, uh, this presentation mode so that I'm not doing the wrong thing. Um, okay, I will do it just now, okay. Wow. Okay, just one moment, give me one moment and I will be there. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So let me just finish off with one last uh, slide. I came across um, this picture on WhatsApp. WhatsApp has its own ways of um, spreading knowledge and information. And this picture really spoke to me volumes. And it said, there is need for organizations to transform their mind, uh, mindsets. And that given the effects of the current pandemic, there is a very clear focus on purpose. That organizations are no longer focused on profits, but they should focus on purpose. Once they focus on purpose, profit will, be, will just come naturally. That there is now a shift from hierarchies to networks. So for you as a board member, for you as a member of the management team, are you relying on the old hierarchies that you had? Or are you working towards developing networks for your institution? That there is a shift away from being controlling. Now we are talking about empowering. Many years ago, as parents, we controlled children. There is no way a child would um, even answer you, dare to answer you at home. But now, the current generation, you tell them not to watch TV and they're asking you why. 
it is about empowering making them understand so there is a shift from controlling to empowering right now we have to move from planning to experimentation that gone are the days that we will put in place a strategic plan for 10 years and you sat pretty, you only focused on it on the ninth year because you needed to put a new strategy in place. Right now, things are so volatile, things are so uncertain that unless you are experimenting with a number of ideas, you could very easily find that you are extinct there is a lot of transparency things are now not private anymore even things that are discussed in state house we find them out here what about your organization you have got to make sure that whatever is going on in your organization it is something you can stand up to that if it was splashed on the front of the nation newspaper or standard newspaper, that you would not feel embarrassed about it. Because organizations are very transparent now. So there's a shift in mindsets. For us to transform the institutions we lead, we too must transform our mindsets. And so I want to stop there so that we can uh, engage and perhaps respond to a number of questions, share ideas. Please um, feel free to chip in. If you have an idea, feel free to chip in. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be a response to a question. It can be an idea that you want uh, to share. So Muredi, I want to stop there so that we can do the plenary. Thank you very much, Catherine. I love what you have just ended with. It's about transformation. COVID-19 has brought for, uh, to us a factory reset. We are all on a factory reset mode where we are no longer doing things like we always did. And you have delivered to us eight powerful points, which I won't repeat, but I will in advance invite you to our Women in Leadership event that's coming up. And we also have Managing in Heels. Uh, sometime in October, and maybe I can use this as you take a sip of water. I can use this to um, announce some dates that we have leadership and manage, uh, management program on 28th of September. Please diarize it, it will be a virtual uh, program. We will have people like Catherine Musakali, of course, we'll be speaking to her separately, speaking to us on how do we deal in our current status so please mark 28th september 2020 we also have um uh, man, uh managers women in leadership conference that's going to run between 28th to 30th october that's next month that is a women in leadership uh, conference and then we are going to be having a managers women uh, manager managing in hills dinner we are speaking to some restaurants which are already open we want to see if it's going to be possible and if it's not possible we'll find another way out so thank you very much catherine but uh, moriti will be giving a vote of thanks much later and i will go straight to some questions which had come in and as i allow anybody who wish to unmute themselves and maybe ask questions so during registration um we received uh, questions that we wish to ask Catherine to respond to. And some of the questions are very narrow because what she's done today, you've given us a very broad perspective, which is amazing. Um, wow. Yes, I'll go straight to this one. There are many human resource questions. So like how prepared are the boards and management in handling human resource post COVID-19 so as to ensure productivity and guaranteed stability? I know you spoke a bit about that on sustainability, but you will speak to us about that. And then another question, I'll say three and I shut up. What are the boards 
and management doing to ensure that measures put in place to curb the pandemic do not adversely affect required output and expected performance? Um, wow, there's a very interesting one here, maybe my favorite. How do we go about bonuses and dividends without crippling the company and disappointing employees? So I will leave those three and then we'll ask some more. Catherine, okay. over to you. Let me start with uh, the last one. Um, how do you go about bonuses and dividends so that you do not cripple the company and uh, um, make employees dissatisfied? First and foremost, I am sure that if you're a profit-making um, uh, company, I would expect that you have a dividend policy. The first thing that the board must do and management must initiate this process is to ask whether that dividend policy is still relevant today, given where we are at. Chances are it is still relevant because usually what dividend policies will do is they will say that dividends will only be declared if a certain amount of profitability has been reached. Now, the, the question, however, that boards and management need to ask is what are the prospects of the business going forward? And does the dividend policy address that issue? So that you may have reached, and by the way, there are companies, it's not all doom. There are companies even in this business environment whose businesses have thrived, who have performed like never before. If you think about BOC, for argument's sake, the people who deliver oxygen, they have never sold so much oxygen in their life. And therefore, for BOC, as a shareholder, I would be expecting a dividend because the business has done well, has thrived. And even into the future, it doesn't look like the business will go down. But if I'm on the other hand, I am in the airline industry, surely am I unreasonable to be expecting a dividend when I am not even sure about the future? And so I go back to the point that I raised earlier, which is stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management. Is the board and management engaging their stakeholders so that all these issues are discussed. When it comes to bonuses, which could include bonuses to staff, are you engaging how your staff, I mean, are you engaging your staff so that they know where the business prospects are, so that they know the business performance? And indeed, um, if the business is performing well, dividends should be paid. But they should only be paid if there are prospects as well going into the future. Bonuses should be paid, but it should only be paid if there are prospects going into the future. So that's the issue on uh, dividends. The second question you asked is, um, how, what are boards and management doing no, and what steps do the boards and management need to take in place so that they ensure that the COVID-19 measures do not impact performance in the future? Was, am I right, uh, Phyllis? Yes, yes. Okay. Any steps that are taken by management and boards need to be long-term in view. In other words, don't take short-term decisions which will negatively impact the business in the future. Remember what I talked about when I gave the example of Shell selling the stations in Western Kenya only to come back and buy them back five years later at five times the price. So whatever decision you take now, think about it 
and think about the impact of that decision in the future. If you're in the insurance industry, for example, there are very, very few actuaries here in Kenya. If you have been lucky and have secured one actuary, maybe that is the last person you should leave to go if you have to let go of staff. Because getting back an actuary is not very easy given the shortage of skills. So just keep the sustainability of the business in mind and that will help you make decisions that are long-term in nature as opposed to uh, short-term in, in the future, I mean short-term. And I think Phyllis, that also responds to the first questions. Um, the first question was around uh, boards and management dealing with HR matters, isn't it? Productivity, now, yes. Sorry, sorry, just Productivity. Repeating. Productivity, um, okay. Yes, how prepared are boards and management in handling human resource yeah. uh, post-COVID-19 so as to ensure productivity and guarantee stability? I want to say that the key to that response actually lies in emotional intelligence. How are you engaging with your staff so that they are so aligned to productivity that they will not let you down? How are you making them feel like they have a sense of ownership in the institution? And allow me also to say that as boards and management, you are not always, um, you don't always know everything. And therefore, do feel free to reach out to the experts in the area so that they can guide you. Employee matters are so critical now. You need to make sure that employees, at least the ones that you have on board, feel valued because they are aware of the market out there. And because they are aware of the market out there, if you treat them well, they are likely to treat you even better. Think about it. If you have an employee who's very committed to you, they will lay down their life for you. And so make them feel valued, make them feel appreciated, and sure enough, you will sort out the issue of productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Then there's an um, MD, Managing Director, who has asked, how do I, as MD, monitor employee performance? And I can combine that. I'll give you three questions. So the first one is, how does the mo uh, Managing Director monitor employee uh, performance? Then what are the functions of boards with regards to finding internal auditors? So what's a function of boards with okay. finding? And then I can ask the last one. Um, wow, what are the risk areas to focus on as a board? Okay. So um, let me start with how do I, as a managing director, monitor the performance of my KPIs, of, of my employees? My understanding is that the managing director is talking about the virtual environment. Otherwise, my understanding would be it's the usual thing that you do. So the way in which you can help or rather you can manage employee performance, if I was in your shoes, is make, um, have a look at your performance management system and process and ensure that you have clear deliverables from your staff, that you have clear KPIs that are smart and which can be tracked. Because remember, in the virtual environment, we are not monitoring that employees are working from eight to five. We are more focused on the deliverables. What are they delivering? Because you are not able to sit somewhere on a laptop and watch that they are sitting at their desk working on your issues. So the best thing to do is to make sure that your targets are based on specific deliverable things 
that you can measure, that you can track. Have them call in to you every day to tell you what they have done during the day. What have they achieved during the day? But I want you to focus more on deliverables as opposed to time. That you're asking them to sit at their desks every day to work. The truth of the matter is, many of these employees are also parents. And many parents are being called upon to watch their children as the children do virtual learning. So they are not going to be working for you. Truth be told, they are not going to be working for you eight to five. The only way you can get them to work for you is to give them targets that are measurable, that are smart, that you can track so that you are, you are sure that they are actually delivering on their jobs. The second question was around <clears throat> the role of the board in finding internal auditors. Uh, Phyllis, was that the question? Yes. yes. The board is responsible for uh, finding and employing internal auditors. In fact, in many charters, board charters, you will find that it is the committee responsible for internal audit that hires the internal auditor. The internal auditor reports to the board through that committee. And because of that, the board through that committee sits on the interview panel for the internal auditor. The internal auditor has two reporting lines, one to the board through that committee and administratively, only administratively to the CEO. Why? Because the CEO is the auditee. That is why the internal auditor reports directly to the board. And so the board is responsible for hiring and firing the internal auditor. Key risk areas. Um, I think one of the key risk areas, I have talked about a number of them, but I think one of the key risk areas that we need to watch out for now is loss of data because a lot of our work is now virtual. We are using technology, so all those risks that come with cybersecurity, loss of data, uh, information espionage, so on and so forth, that is critical. The other key uh, risk for us as businesses, as, in, as institutions, is loss of staff. Because organizations, if you're not watching what your employees are doing, Chances are they're even having three, four jobs and you have no clue. So you could very much, very easily lose critical staff that uh, if you're not careful. Another key area is morale, you know, low morale for staff, particularly where the business is not doing well and there's really no future. So you need to make sure that you're continuously engaging with your staff to make sure that their morale is where it ought to be. So those are some of the areas that perhaps I can mention, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Allow me, please allow me to ask the last set of questions. Okay. So there's a question, would it be possible for various organizational boards of management to avoid sitting in board meetings with the aim of reducing costs as a lesson learned in post-COVID-19. Post so yes, can boards reduce their sitting? Perhaps yeah. I think it's something to do with the sitting allowance. Mm -hmm. Then there's a question on, am I under any obligation to pay staff who are not at work due to reduced business volume? Okay, all right. And so I let me, that's it. yeah. Okay, let me start with the first one. Can you avoid uh, board members sitting in board meet? For sure, the one thing that you can avoid is the whole issue of uh, paying board members, driving to uh, the institution to sit in a board meeting, so on and so forth. That you can avoid. Because 
I am aware of boards that have completely gone virtual. They hardly have physical meetings. In fact, I have a client who has said the board meetings will all be virtual except one meeting per year, which will be face to face. The rest will be virtual. So that way you can also uh, cut costs. Now you will need, it is, by the way, remember, the board sets the remuneration policy for itself, which is then approved by the shareholders. And so the board needs to sit back and to say, because we are not spending time in the traffic, going to the institution, so on and so forth, is there a need for us to reduce our allowance for board meetings? Is there a need for us? But remember also, the business might be suffering. I'm also aware of boards that have given up their um, uh, allowances just to cushion the business. So it really depends on where your business is. But for sure, please leverage technology because that will also help you cut a lot of costs. There are very many online platforms that boards can leverage to use um, in terms of their board meetings so that a lot of decisions are made very, very quickly without the necessity of wait waiting for our quarterly meetings. And that's the beauty, leveraging technology for quicker, faster decision making. Uh, that makes the uh, organization much, much more agile than it was before. And then the last question was, am I under any obligation to pay staff uh, who perhaps you're not engaging 100% uh, because of uh, uh, loss of business or reduced business? Yes, you are. Yes, you must. For so long as you have not uh, varied their contracts of employment, then you are under an obligation to pay them. And there are ways of varying their contracts of employment. But until you do that, uh, you cannot tell me, Catherine, I've been engaging you 50% of your time. And therefore, this month, I am only going to pay you 50% of your salary. That will not fly in law. And so make sure that if you need to vary their contracts of employment, and of course, the varying of courts, uh, contracts of employment, they will need to consent. Unless they consent, then you have you have a problem as well. Thank you, Phyllis. Wow. Thank you for that enlightenment, especially around varying contracts of employment before touching uh, the salaries of staff. So Moritin Degwa has asked one more last question. Um, and it's in the chat button. And um, for all the other members, please visit chat so as to see opportunities that are coming up. So. Moriti Degwa says, I really like your end notes, mindset shift, mindset shifts for organizational transformation. This starts with you as an individual. Please briefly enlighten our members on some of the individual transformations that lead to positive organizational transformation. Thank you. Wow, Moriti, I think you are just trying to trick me there. <laughs> So, so, so first, I think that the first thing that I must uh, um, say with regard to individual transformation is this, that as an individual, you must start by having a positive attitude. Unless you have a positive attitude, an I can do type of attitude, and I can achieve type of attitude, you're not going anywhere. So a lot of business transformation starts with you. The second one is about being um, agile in decision making. As individuals, let's cut the red tape. Let's not be hung up on bureaucracy. Because unless you're first in into the door, the business opportunity is going to be taken by somebody else. So stop being too um, rigid about certain things. You need to be agile. You need 
to be quick in decision making, you need to have the right mindset to drive the organization. Remember my issues about emotional intelligence. Those are critical for you as an individual. The other thing about um, an individual is just having a positive outlook to life. Because having a positive outlook really impacts the way you deal with other people and the way ultimately they start to engage with you. So as a leader, as a board member, having that positive outlook is very important. And it must be manifest on your face. Because if I walk into a company that is struggling, and I am walking and looking like, my goodness, I'm not going anywhere, that mood just rubs off the rest of the staff. So thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you so much uh, for what you've delivered. It's just enormous, and we can actually spend a lot of time here because as you ask questions, more questions are coming up. But I wish to welcome Boris Indegua uh, right now uh, so that he can give us a vote of thanks. Um, just before you um, go, Phyllis, allow me to just share one thing which I think is very, very important for uh, boards of organizations and management teams. And this was shared with me by a friend of mine, and it is called the five directional model of governance. The five directional model of governance requires boards to think in five distinct ways, which is that boards first and foremost should be forward looking that's the first and most important thing that boards should be forward looking and in being forward looking they should be thinking strategy so the first model of um, um, five directional model of governance says boards must look forward strategically the second limb of that is that boards must look backward retrospectively so even as you're looking forward strategically you must also ask yourself and this by the way applies to personal life as well you must also ask yourself the question in the past what did not work so well and how can i ensure that in the future it works. What are those things that I need to work on? So first, look forward strategically. Second, look backward retrospectively, ensuring that any challenges that you faced in the future, you address going forward. The third one is that boards and management, and even you at individual level, you must look forward. You must look outward engagingly. What does that mean? Looking outward engagingly means stakeholder engagement. The boards must engage their stakeholders. Management teams must engage their stakeholders. Phyllis, in your individual life, you must have networks. You must engage those networks for you to get forward, to move forward. The next limb is that boards must look inward introspectively that even as you think about those things that held you back as a board at individual level what are the things that held you back what are the things that propelled you forward and the last thing is that boards must look upward soberly and hopefully knowing that there is a higher being who is more powerful than you, who you look to for guidance when you need guidance. That being, if you are a Christian, it is God. If you are a Muslim, it is Allah. Whatever that being, whoever that being is, that you cannot afford to do without 
that being. I'm sure even atheists have somewhere they look. I don't know, but I'm sure they do. So five directional model of governance. Looking forward strategically, looking backward retrospectively, looking outward engagingly, looking inward introspectively, and lastly, looking upward soberly and hopefully. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so, so very much, um, Catherine, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Felix, for leading us so very well today. Let's give a huge relation to Catherine for that fantastic discourse. That's the way they do it electronically, and Catherine, be blessed, and thank you so very much for the support and also for the discourse that you've given us, which really and truly was excellent. Thank you so very much.